Welcome back to our Bible study. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, O Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John the Apostle, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Joan of Arc, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, we've arrived at some pretty important chapters, so we're going to cover, hopefully we'll get through, uh, chapter 11 and chapter 12 of the Apocalypse today. So let's get into it. So in the Apocalypse, as we just saw, we had the first 10 chapters, and now we're going to transition into an important two sets of chapters. The first 10 chapters deal with a number of things that have to do with a book that has to be read. There was epistles that were read at the beginning. There was sort of a call to penance. And then finally, St. John receives this scroll or this book from this mighty angel, and then he takes it inside himself. He, he eats it. That's, what we, that's where we left off. Now we're going to see the preaching of the two witnesses. Notice the structure it's following. There's a penitential uh, part. There's the reading of epistles. There's a scroll. All in the context of a liturgical action that's taking place in heaven. This is just like our first part of Holy Mass. We have a penitential rite. We have the reading of epistles. We have the receiving of a book or a scroll of the gospel. And then we're going to have the preaching, just like we have a sermon in Holy Mass. Now we're going to have the preaching of the two witnesses. And then later on, we're going to see it's going to culminate in the marriage supper of the Lamb, just like at Holy Mass. So we can see this liturgical structure to the book of Revelation. Okay, So let's take a look at where we are and let's get into it. Okay. So we have this structure of the Apocalypse. And you can see where we're at. We're going to cover chapter 11, the two witnesses. So the two witnesses, who are these two mysterious characters? Now there's a, a number of theories as to uh, who these are. But before those witnesses get on the scene, we see that John is given a reed to measure the temple. So what does that mean? Why is he measuring the temple? Well, Anytime you see something mysterious, remember the new th things in the New Testament are explained by things in the Old Testament. So there is an event that was very similar to this in the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel, in the prophet Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel was uh, also told to measure the temple. Now, what he was told in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 5, he's told to measure the temple, the altar, and the adorers therein. Okay, so what that means then, when the, the temple is being measured, the altar is being measured, the adorers inside are being measured. What that means is they're being measured up to a standard. So this is an act of judgment. God, as it were, is going to judge his temple. He's going to judge his church. He's going to judge the altar, the priests. He's going to judge the adorers therein. So everyone is going to be, we're all going to be judged. We know that. We're going to be held to, uh, at uh, task, as it were, at the particular judgment, and then again at the uh, final judgment, the general judgment. And so we also see another detail that's added. They shall tread the city underfoot 42 months. So what is the city that we're talking about? Well, in Revelation 11, verse 2, it says that the holy city, uh, the we shall be tread underfoot for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. Okay. So, oh, by the way, I should correct something. Uh, I should have done this at the outset. So at the last, in the last class, if you remember, I mentioned something about 200,000 and a third of the number of the uh, Exodus. Uh, so uh, I know I, I don't have a brain eating amoeba that destroys my ability to do math. Uh, I was actually, uh, I misspoke in stating that uh, 20,000 times 10,000 is 200,000. That's not the case. Uh, 20,000 times 10,000 is 200 million. 
But this number does have a reference to a third of the Exodus, like I was mentioning, and it's because of this. The, there's the 200,000 in the Exodus, but when that number is multiplied times a thousand, a thousand being a number of all completion of all fullness, it says that God shall reign for a thousand years. Now, it doesn't mean that after a thousand years his reign ends. God reigns forever. But the thousand years is a, a symbolic number that expresses a fullness. Now, the 200,000 in the Exodus, that was definitely particular, and it was temporal to that time, to that nation, the Israelites. But the 200,000 times 1,000, which is where you get the 200 million, or the 20,000 times 10,000, uh, this is back in chapter 9, uh, that shows that the, the number of the Exodus, the third part, times a thousand, saying it's for all time, for all completion. In other words, it's like the Exodus, but extended out in its fullness, uh, extended out throughout time. So, uh, I don't know if that's quite clear or not, but um, like I say, there is a reference to that 200,000 in the Exodus, the third of the Exodus, as I was mentioning, a third of the people were in this army in chapter 9. But then it's that number, the third of the Exodus, 200,000, times a thousand. The, this number of completion, which means the that that's army extended throughout time in its fullness. Okay, so uh, that was a little uh, number correction I wanted to give uh, as we uh, proceed on. Okay, so what about this uh, treading um, the city underfoot uh, for the, the three years? Uh, the 42 months are mentioned in um, 11 verse 2. But then the two witnesses are given to preach, and it says that they shall prophesy 1,260 days. Now that's about three and a half years also. Uh, let's take a look at something that should explain it a little more clearly. Okay. So there's the 42 months as compared to the 1,260 days. Okay. So three and a half years versus... Uh, the, 40, the 42 months uh, versus the 1260 days. So the three and a half years is the reign of the Antichrist. So in Apocalypse chapter 11 verse 12 we have this three and a half years but also in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 uh, we, we have this, this number given again. Let's take a look at that. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. So here we have in Daniel 7, uh, verse 25, it says that, uh, speaking of the Antichrist, he shall speak words against the High One and shall crush the saints of the Most High, and he shall think himself able to change times and laws, and there shall be delivered, they shall be delivered into his hand unto a time and times and a half time. So what does this mean? All the church fathers, when they look at this expression, he says, a time, well, the ultimate measure of time for the Jew is the year, right? You have days measured by the movement of the sun, you have uh, months measured by the movement of the moon, and then a year measured by the movement of the stars. So, a time, and then he says, times, so now it's plural, so the fathers said that that's a, that's a, a double, that's a Two, two, two times, so now you see we got three, and then a half time, half a year, so three and a half years. This is where the church fathers say that the Antichrist will reign for three and a half years, and so that's what is uh, being referenced here. So, uh, and that is also 42 months, and that's what uh, they shall they shall tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Okay. Now, then there are these, these two witnesses which uh, are going to prophesy just shy of um, 42 months because the 1,260 days is actually 18 days shy of 42 months. And this is because the Antichrist will conquer, as we're going to see, the Antichrist will conquer the two witnesses and um, have a sort of a, he will appear to have victory over them, uh, but then they're going to be raised up. Uh, so they just, they almost reach the three and a half years, but they are there preaching for those three and a half years, the one, well, the 1,260 days, to give us consolation, to give us encouragement uh, as we are under the trial of living under the Antichrist. Okay, so 
now they have a reference to these two olive trees. Let's, look, let's take a look and see what that means, huh? So we have these two olive trees mentioned in verse 4. It says, the two olive trees and the two candlesticks that stand before the Lord of the earth. It says, these witnesses are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks that stand before the Lord of the earth. So I want to give you another principle uh, that's going to help explain this thing. This is a, a little different principle than we've given before. Okay, here's the principle. Prophecies fulfilled in the New Covenant often have a temporary fulfillment in the Old. Prophecies fulfilled in the New Covenant often have a temporary fulfillment in the Old. So we can see temporary fulfillments in the Old Covenant, but it doesn't mean that that's had its full fulfillment, right? It might be pointing towards something in the future. For example, Isaiah chapter 7, where he says, um, where, the, where the prophet says uh, to uh, Achaz, uh, Elijah says to Achaz, ask the sign, ask a sign of, of the Lord. I'm sorry, Isaiah asks, um, uh, says to him, ask for a sign for the Lord. And he says, I will not tempt the Lord, I will not ask for a sign. And then uh, the prophet then says, well, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The woman shall conceive, the virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son. And uh, his name will be Emmanuel, right? So this is Isaiah chapter 7, verse uh, 14. So this it has a temporary, it had a temporary fulfillment because there, uh, there was, as part of that prophecy, he mentions about the army coming upon you and, and uh, there, there will be a son born that will deliver you. Well, that had a temporary fulfillment in the old uh, covenant that freed them from the, the, uh, the onslaught that was about to take place under King Ahaz in the Old Testament. But then there is an ultimate fulfillment in our Lord, who was the son of the virgin, uh, the woman, um, the virgin who, who conceived and bore a son. So uh, we just want to keep that in mind, these, these, uh, uh, these principles, okay? So let's take a look then back at this verse. Two olive trees and the two candlesticks that stand before the Lord of the earth. We're going to see this... Um, We see this uh, fulfilled in Zechariah, okay? Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2 through 3. Notice the similarity there. A candlestick and two olive trees. These are the two sons of oil who stand before the Lord of the whole earth. Okay, so notice the similarity. Uh, a candlestick, two olive trees... They stand before the Lord of the earth, right? But now, who are these uh, ref in reference to in Zechariah? Who are, to whom are these referring in Zechariah? It's quite interesting because in Zechariah we have a high priest. The two olive trees are, are mentioned. They're, they are sons of oil. That is, they are anointed ones. One was a king and one was the high priest. So in Zechariah chapter 14, uh, these... Uh, these two olive trees, these two sons of oil. One of them was the high priest, and the other was a man by the name of Jesus. Right? You might be surprised that name's in the Old Testament, but you know the name of Jesus is, uh, is actually, um, it's the name of Joshua. Joshua is simply the, the Hebrew form uh, of that name. Um, so uh, in Zechariah, I'm sorry, I was saying 14, it's uh, chapter 4. Uh, verse 2 through 4, uh, and then again in verse 14. So he sees this, uh, this image, it's the high priest, and it's also uh, the high priest's name is Jesus. So you can find that back in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, is where it gives the name of this son of oil. So it's a pretty neat foreshadow of our blessed Lord, whose name, of course, is Jesus in the New Covenant. Okay. Now, let's move on to these witnesses. Who are these, these two witnesses? Let's see if we can determine who they are. So the two witnesses, some say Moses and Elias. Why would they say it Mo could be Moses and Elias? Well, if you remember, um, in verse 6, it says, uh, it describes something about these witnesses. One says that one of them has the power to shut up the heavens so that it does not rain. 
And then another has the power to turn the waters into blood and strike the earth with all plagues. Do you remember in the Old Testament, you remember there were two prophets that did this, Elijah and then uh, Moses. So uh, that's why some will say that these two witnesses are Moses and Elias. Remember, Moses turned the water into blood, Exodus 7, verse 19. And then Elias, or Elijah, uh, Elias is simply the form you'll find, uh, Latinized form you'll find out in the Douay Reim, but Elijah is a more Hebraic form, but it's the same name. Elias, or Elijah, kept the sky from raining for three and a half years. In the third book of Kings, chapter 17, verse 1. And if you have uh, an RSV, it would be uh, first book of Kings, chapter 17, verse 1. So that's what some say are these, are these two witnesses, okay? But there's another idea which uh, I think has a, a little bit more solid ground. So it, some, as I said, will say these are Moses and, Eli and Elijah. Uh, but then the majority of others say that it is Elijah, yes. But then another one. Let's take a look who is this other one. So, as I said, nearly all agree on Elias. Remember in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, he says, I will send you Elias before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's the day of judgment. Also, we see in Ecclesiasticus chapter 48, verse 10, in the judgments of times, Elias is to restore the tribes of Jacob. He is to restore the tribes of Jacob. So, what about this other one? There's this other witness, and I said there's some dispute. Uh, who's this other one? Uh, let's, let's take a look, see who, who we have. So the other witness, the majority say that it is Enoch and Elias, not Moses. So why would they say Enoch? Well, remember, Moses died, but Enoch was taken into paradise and hasn't died. Now, why is that important? Why does it matter? Well, it's because in verse 7, we see that these two witnesses die. But Moses has already died. Elijah did not die. Remember, he was taken up into the chariot when he passed off the mantle of his prophecy to Elisha, or Eliseus, depending on how your Bible reads. It's the same name, Elisha or Eliseus. He passed on his mantle, his prophecy role to uh, his next prophet, Elisha. And then Elijah was taken up in the fiery chariot up into heaven. So he has not died yet. Enoch has also not died. If you remember, let's take a look again through that verse up there. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And this is where it says, Enoch was taken into paradise. He pleased the Lord and was taken into paradise. But then we also have another reference, also in the book of Ecclesiasticus, that great book of Ecclesiasticus, which is uh, part of the Catholic Bible, but is missing from, it was one of the seven that's missing from the Protestant Bible. So anyway, I'll get off my apologetic soapbox. But uh, So Ecclesiasticus, let's see what it says there, uh, this other verse. Enoch was translated into paradise, that he may give repentance to the nations. Ecclesiasticus chapter 44, verse 16. That he may give repentance to the nations. In other words, that he may, re uh, he may uh, convert the nations, the Gentiles. Um, in case you're wondering, Ecclesiasticus, I don't have that book in my Bible. Uh, well, if you're using a Catholic Bible, you might still have it, and it's called also Sirach. Some people know it by Sirach. So, Enoch was translated into paradise. Okay, that's... It's, it's not the beatific vision. It's not like he had the face-to-face -face vision of God. Uh, what the church fathers say is that uh, he was translated to some place on earth hidden from the eyes of men. They survived, he survived the flood and was placed back on the earth in some place that we call paradise. He was sort of in the presence of God. But like Adam and Eve, they were in the presence of God, but they didn't enjoy the beatific vision. If Adam and Eve had enjoyed the beatific vision, they could not have sinned, because they would have seen God in his essence. Adam and Eve did not see God in his essence, and that's why 
they couldn't see the, his unadulterated goodness, and, and so they, it was possible for them to choose something else mistakenly thinking it was going to be a good. So um, that verse there, let's take a look at it again, that verse in Ecclesiastes 44, verse 16, he was translated into paradise that he may give repentance to the nations. So it's from here that we come up with the idea, as the, the church fathers have told us, that Elijah will come back to preach to the Jews and Enoch will come back to preach to the Gentiles. Okay, so uh, these, these two witnesses then, they're going to come back. Enoch is translated into paradise, so he may give repentance to the nations, the Gentiles. So remember, Enoch predated the whole dis distinction between uh, Jews and non-Jews, because this is in Genesis, this is before uh, the flood even. Ecclesiasticus 44, verse 16, Enoch will... Uh, will give repentance to the nation. He'll preach to the Gentiles. And then Elias will come back to reconcile the heart of the Father to the Son and to restore the tribes of Jacob. So Elias, or Elijah, will preach to the Jews. That's what his mission is going to be. It's to, to preach to the Jews. <clears throat> so these are the two witnesses. Now, St. Robert Bellarmine says that it is heresy or proximate to heresy to deny that the two witnesses are Enoch and Elias. I know there's well-founded reasons to say Moses, but remember, it is also said, I believe it's in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, if I'm remembering correctly, that it is appointed for man to die once, and then comes the judgment. So, we're only going to die once. Moses has already died. Um, there's even mention of uh, disputing over the body of Moses in the book of Jude, and so um, he's, he's dead, you know, so he's not going to be resuscitated like Lazarus was after four days. No, um, he's already died. That's his time, and his time in the Old Covenant has come to an end. But Enoch and Elias, um, they were lifted out, raised above the mess to come back and then to give witness with their death. That's what we're going to take a look at next. Let's take a look. The death of the two witnesses. So they preach, and then they are killed. I suppose every priest who's preaching the truth may have, at one point or another, have this fear that, well, my parishioners are going to kill me. But uh, these men, they actually did kill. So it says that when they finish their testimony, uh, they... Uh, the beast that ascendeth out of the abyss shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And it says that their bodies shall lie in the streets of Jerusalem, which is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt, and there was none to bury them. Okay, so now notice this verse here from Psalm 78. It says, The dead bodies of thy servant about Jerusalem, there was none to bury them. So can you see how this psalm, Psalm 78 or 79, and it depends which Bible version you're using, is saying that this similar thing, where the servants shall be dead, there'll be none to bury them, it's referring to the city of Jerusalem. Um, but we have it actually quite clear in verse 8, where we see, Their bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is called spiritually Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord also was crucified. So that is Jerusalem, obviously. That's where our Lord was crucified. That's a very key line. Chapter 11, verse 8, it's going to come up later because there are those, and if now I know if you've heard anything about the book of the Apocalypse, and if you're a Catholic and you know people who are not Catholic, you will probably have heard this, that they say, ah, the whore of Babylon is the Catholic Church. You ever hear that nonsense? Okay, I've heard it, and a number of my parishioners have heard it also. People who don't know what they're talking about as they delve into the book of Revelation, they say, the whore of Babylon is the Catholic Church. And this is actually a verse that's going to show how that is not true, because it says, the great city, the great city, where their Lord was crucified. That is not Rome, it's Jerusalem. That's where Christ was crucified. Later on, we're going to see why that's important and how this then does not, uh, you know, steers away from the idea that Rome is the whore of Babylon. No, it's Jerusalem. But I'm jumping ahead. So let's, let's get back to this issue 
of the death of the two witnesses. There was none to bury them. And there's a reference there to Sodom. Notice how this great city is called Sodom in Apocalypse chapter 11, verse 8. But we also see that Jerusalem was called Sodom in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, where we see the vision of Isaiah concerning Jerusalem. And then Jerusalem is being addressed, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Now, Sodom had long since been destroyed at this point, but Isaiah is calling Jerusalem Sodom because of their sinfulness, their wickedness that had reached to the level of Sodom. That's what's going on here. So you can see now how Sodom is a reference to uh, Jerusalem. Elsewhere, Jerusalem is also called Egypt because of its sinfulness as it has uh, become like Egypt. They become as pagan uh, and as uh, oppressive as Pharaoh was to the Israelites. Uh, in, in Egypt. So we, we, you see both from the reference to Sodom and the reference to Egypt and also where their Lord was crucified that this great city is called, is actually Jerusalem, is a reference to Jerusalem. Okay. So the death of the two witnesses, uh, there's a tapestry of the, the death of the two witnesses. You, you, can, you can see them uh, you can see them uh, right down here. Okay, and then uh, here's John. St. John is writing the witness. He's writing the, uh, the apocalypse. And then here's the city. And this represents those that slayed the two witnesses. But thankfully, there's the resurrection. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. Okay, so they were uh, resurrected. Um, however, uh, before I get to that verse, there's something else I want to point out, and this is in uh, verse 9. Now, perhaps when St. John was writing this, he might not have known how this could be true, what was written in verse 9. But he wrote it anyway because it was a prophetic revelation, and he wrote obediently what God revealed to him. Might not be present to his mind. He could, perhaps he could not understand how this could be fulfilled in his time. But let's take a look. This is verse 9. And they of the tribes and the peoples and tongues and nations shall see their bodies for three and a half days. Now how in the time of St. John could the nations see the bodies of two people that are lying in the streets of Jerusalem? in his time. But in our time, is it possible to see what's happening in the streets of Jerusalem today, for the nations to see that? It's quite interesting. So let's uh, take a look at the resurrection of the two witnesses. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. What's interesting about this is there is a parallel passage in Ezekiel chapter 37. That's when he had this vision of the bones in the field, you know, these, this army that was dead. And notice how the, similar it is. The Spirit came into them, and they lived, and they stood up upon their feet. Notice it's almost verbatim. The second part is verbatim from Apocalypse chapter 11, verse 11. So there we have the resurrection, and then they are taken up into heaven. So to the horror of the minions of the Antichrist, these two that they thought they had conquered, they had overcame, are resurrected, and they are taken up to be with God. So now what follows is we have the sounding of the seventh trumpet. So the sounding of the seventh trumpet uh, takes place, and again, kind of like the breaking open of the seventh seal that we saw earlier, According to what we were maybe expecting, if we're looking on some sort of earthly, dramatic, cataclysmic level, it seems a bit anticlimactic. Because remember the previous six seals, you know, back in uh, chapter 6 and 7, the previous six seals, as those were being opened, there was calamity, earthquakes, thunders, lightning, plagues. And then the seventh seal is broken open, and what do we have? We have a lamb that appears. We have a liturgical action. 
that's what's going on at the culmination. Remember the seventh, the number seven? It has to do with a covenant. And so when the seventh seal is broken, we see the appearance of a lamb standing as though uh, slain. And there was silence in heaven for a, about a half an hour. That's right at the beginning of the Apocalypse uh, chapter, verse, uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Silence for half hour about the space of a holy mass. And uh, we have a golden censer and altar. Well, likewise, at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, we have something perhaps anticlimactic to the sounding of the previous seven trumpets. Let's see what that is. At the sounding of the seventh trumpet, we have voices in heaven. The kingdom is become our Lord's and His Christ. And then the temple of God open, and the Ark of the Covenant appears. The kingdom has become our Lord's and His Christ, and the temple of God is open, and the Ark of the Covenant appears. So, we have this, uh, we have sort of a, another liturgical action. These voices in heaven, they're, they're singing this uh, sort of a doxology, um, and uh, there is a, uh, uh, you know, praise rendered to God, he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we have these voices, these liturgical, liturgical action. It's, uh, whenever you have the singing um, of many voices, this, this would bring the Jewish mind back to the singing of the Levites in the temple. Um, okay. Then we have uh, this really momentous line, and this is... Um, the 11th chapter, verse 19. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his testament was seen in his temple. That's a, that's a tremendous line. There it is. I just threw the Greek in there because it is a, a momentous line. Um, the ark of the covenant was seen. Now, Think about what that means to the Jew. The Ark of the Covenant was seen? No Jew, no Levite had seen the Ark of the Covenant. What I mean by that is it was the sons of Aaron that had to go in and cover the Ark whenever they were going to move the camp. So even the Levites, the ordinary Levites, couldn't even look upon the Ark of the Covenant. But now, in Revelation chapter 11, the Ark of the Covenant is seen. It's absolutely stupendous for the Jews for this to happen. You know, they, they couldn't look upon it without dying. They couldn't touch it without dying. It was always covered and was only visible to the high priest. Only the high priest could see the Ark of the Covenant. But now in this revelation, in this unveiling, which is what revelation means, the Ark of His Testament is seen in the temple of Almighty God. And that's going to lead us to the next chapter because this verse is connected with the very next verse. And uh, as we get there, uh, let's uh, remember we can, you can ask your, your questions on uh, Facebook, on our Facebook page. Uh, so uh, you can submit those, those questions on our uh, St. Joan of Arc. Uh, Facebook page. We'll get those at the end and we'll um, spend about the last half hour answering any questions which may come in. So uh, please submit those, um, uh, please. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, chapter 12. Chapter 12, he sees this great sign in the sky. The Ark of the Testament was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings and voices and an earthquake and great hail. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. So here you have the Ark of the Covenant in the sky. That's the way this artist has rendered it. Then you have the woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet. We're going to see in a moment the dragon with the seven heads and ten horns. And then with his tail, he's going to sweep a third of the stars from the sky, but there's also another image which we should all be familiar with as Catholics, and that's this one. 
the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, a crown of 12 stars around her head. You don't quite see 12 here, but there's certainly the stars surrounding her head here. And she was being with child, she travailed to give birth. Of course, in the image of Our Lady Guadalupe, this, this band around her waist, which is tied, you see right here around her waist, was an indication that she was with child in the, uh, in the Aztec uh, culture. That was, that was a sign of that. But remember the dragon, we're going to see him in a moment. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered, that he might devour her son. So the dragon stood at the feet of the woman. Now, it's quite interesting. I remember as a child, I remember seeing this image. And I'd see this image in our church, and I'd be looking at it when I was a little child. I'd see, of course, Our Lady. I would see the sun. I would see the mantle. But I always used to wonder, I was like, why is she standing on a monster? A monster that's grimacing. Let's take a look at this again. I mean, this is... This is how I saw it. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't mean that this is actually what's, uh, what's intended by God to be there. But when I was a child, I thought this was a monster. There's the horns of the monster right here. And then I thought these were his eyes. There's uh, the white of his eye. There's the, the iris. And then this, I thought, was his mouth. I mean, I obviously, I saw the angel sitting there, but I thought kind of behind him, there's this mouth kind of grimacing, like, you know, kind of uh, grimacing in pain, like she's standing on top of this monster. I don't know if that's really what's there, but that's how I saw it as a kid, and I, no one had explained this passage. No one had explained this passage in Revelation to me, uh, that there was this dragon, this beast, at the foot of Our Lady waiting to devour her son when he should be born. Um, but, uh, but I thought, well, there's... There's some kind of monster under her standing. She's standing on, crushing the head of. I didn't quite even think crushing the head of because I don't think I knew that verse from Genesis 3.15. But anyway, it's quite interesting. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that verse. Apocalypse chapter 12, verse 1. Sinum manum, Simeon mega, right? Great sign. Now that word Simeon or sign, St. John uses this word elsewhere in his gospel. He uses this to indicate types. He uses this to indicate miracles. Um, there is a, uh, a great talk by, that I heard uh, given by uh, Dr. John Bergsman. He, in this talk, he explains how uh, the seven miracles, and there's only seven described in uh, St. John's Gospel, the seven miracles, which St. John calls signs, right? Simeon, sign. He uses that word to describe each of the miracles, the seven signs, seven miracles that are described in the Gospel of St. John. He says that each one of these signs are actually pointing towards, as a sign, as a type does, pointing towards one of the seven sacraments, that each one of the miracles has a direct line towards one of the seven sacraments. Uh, so it's, it's quite an interesting uh, concept. I, I think uh, there's a lot of merit to it. and. Uh, uh, I, I differed with him on one point as to which sign goes to which one, but that's, that's a talk for another time. But uh, we should get back to the book of Revelation, otherwise we'll never get to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay? So now we have the woman versus the dragon. So the woman versus the dragon uh, symbolizes several things. First, it symbolizes the fight between the church and the devil. In Daniel chapter 12, uh, verse one, uh, we actually see this 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 conflict, right? There's a the, uh, you know a dragon mentioned, and he is uh, he's crushed by Saint Michael, uh, so that's that's worth looking at. Uh, and uh, in case you've met any Jehovah's Witnesses, no, Saint Michael is not our Lord. Uh, so, um, and I'll give you the answer for that. So, there we go. Apologetics moment. Um, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, uh, you can actually see that it is not, St. Michael is not our Lord, okay? Like the Jehovah's Witnesses falsely believe. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 shows that he is clearly above all the other angels. We also see from Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, that our blessed Lord uh, has the helper, Michael. St. Michael is his helper. 
St. Michael is not our Lord. So, okay, let's get back to uh, the book of Revelation. So in uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, At that time Michael, the great prince, great leader, will rise up and will uh, you know, fight for the children, uh, the people of God. At that time thy people shall be saved, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Notice how that language is hearkening back to uh, what we we're seeing in the book of the Revelation. So it does refer to the fight between the church and the devil. That's one thing that this conflict between the woman and the dragon refers to. And then also it refers to the fight between St. Michael and Lucifer. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, uh, verse 12. Uh, it's an example of this. It kind of describes this. So remember in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, uh, this is what we read. We have this. Uh, How art thou fallen from heaven? In a moment we're going to see that dragon cast down from heaven. How art thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, who didst rise in the morning? How art thou fallen to the earth? And that's what he did. He fell to the earth. We see in the apocalypse. He's fallen to the earth. He's cast down to the earth. And he says, and thou saidest in thy heart, I will ascend to heaven. Right in his pride, Lucifer said he will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Another reference to the stars. Um, stars are a type for the angels. Right, I will ascend above the clouds. Right, But then he says in verse 15, but yet thou shalt be brought down to hell into the depth of the pit. And that's exactly where we find him in the book of the Apocalypse, in the pit. Right. He's, uh, there's a time where he's allowed to come out from the pit, but that's where he is. He's relegated to hell, where he belongs. Then this also refers to something else. This is what most Catholics go to when they see this. It's the fight between Our Lady and the devil. Uh, as I mentioned, the lady crushes the head of the serpent, as we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And, of course, we see this conflict between uh, this woman and the dragon. All right, now we have come to the heart of the book of the Apocalypse. We've really come to the heart of this because this chapter, chapter 12, is the center of the chiasm. Remember the chiasm? Remember what that is? It's a liturgical, or a, rather a literary device, uh, but it does show up quite a bit in the liturgy, but it's a literary device wherein the author puts something, posits something at the beginning that is mirrored by a similar event at the end. Then he posits something subsequent to the beginning that's mirrored by an event that's just prior to the end. Another event is very closely mirrored to another event, closer and closer until you get to one central point. The reason we're going in this direction is it sort of forms a Greek letter chi, which is written like an X, that's why they call it a chiasm, because it has that structure. It looks like, you know, if you compare the two and you just kind of funnel them in, channel, you know, uh, match the, 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 the parallel verses, you'll, you'll find it has this shape of a chiasm, of a letter chi. And so this whole chapter has a chiastic structure. I had mentioned earlier how the whole book has a chiastic structure. Uh, if you recall very early on in the introduction, uh, that introduction where we had a lot of technical difficulties, it seems like... Uh, the serpent was always trying to get us through technical problems. But uh, this chapter especially has a chiastic structure. So let's take a look at that. The woman versus the dragon. So first we see the two witnesses. This starts before chapter 12. The two witnesses are overcome in chapter 11, verse 7. And then later on we're going to see that the saints are overcome. But remember, we should have hope. Because, yes, even though the witnesses were overcome, they rose and were taken up to heaven. And so later on, we're going to see in chapter 13, verse 7, that the saints are overcome. We're all going to die. We all have our cross to carry. We have our trials to endure. But we're, we'll overcome, too, if we stay faithful to our Lord. So the two witnesses are overcome, and then later on, the saints are overcome. Then we see, at the beginning of chapter 12, a dragon with seven heads and ten horns appears. Then... We're going to see a beast with seven heads and ten horns appear in chapter 13, verse 1. Then we see the dragon threatens the woman's son in chapter 12, verse 4. We see this paralleled with 
where the dragon threatens the rest of her seed in chapter 12, verse 17. By the way, the rest of her seed, uh, this is not you know, physical children of Our Lady because she did not have other physical children. That's hogwash. That's nonsense. Don't listen to that. Right? Uh, she only had the only begotten Son. She had our blessed Lord. And, um, and then we are the children of of this uh, mother, adopted children. Um, we can go into that later, but that's an apologetics point that we'll have to hit later. The woman fled to the wilderness, chapter 12, verse 6, and then the woman flies to the desert, chapter 12, verse 14. Then we have the fact that she is there for three and a half years, in chapter 12, verse 6, and then we have there, it's paralleled again, that she's there in the wilderness, in the desert, for three and a half years in chapter 12, verse 14. Then we see the dragon cast to the earth in chapter 12, verse 9. And then we see that the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth in chapter 12, verse 13. We see the devils were thrown down, chapter 12, verse 9. And then the devil has come down to the earth, chapter 12, verse 12. We see a loud voice in heaven cry out, chapter 12, verse 10, and then another reference to heaven, Rejoice, O heavens, chapter 12, verse 12. So, what you may ask is at the center, we have the heart, the very heart of the whole apocalypse, and it is this. Let's take a look. Salvation, strength, and the kingdom of God. God comes. Chapter 12, verse 10 and 11. Let's take a look at that verse closely. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, because the accuser of our, of our brethren is cast forth, who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony and they loved not their lives unto death. Folks, that summarizes the entire book of the Apocalypse, but it also summarizes the entire conflict with good and evil and the whole victory of Almighty God. That is what is, it is all about. The coming of salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God, the power of Christ, that's what this life is about. That's what we are called to do. Become a part of bringing salvation, strength, the kingdom of God, thy kingdom come. We pray that every day at the Our Father. Why? Because the accuser is cast forth. The, the devil is the accuser, the adversary. That's what Satan means is adversary, right? Or accuser. Who accused them before our God day and night. He constantly seeks whom he may devour. This is what the accuser does, this is what the devil does. But he is cast out. That's what the victory is. The accuser is cast out. And then also, not only is the casting out a, a, a essential part, not just casting out the evil, but it's receiving the good. And we overcame, and they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. Notice those two halves. Let's look, take a look at that verse. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. Notice what two parts of the Mass are shown there. The blood of the Lamb, right? This is from the offertory on. And then the word of the testimony. It was the liturgy of the word, or right? The, the, rather, we say the, the Mass of the Catechumens, and then the Mass of the Faithful, in which our Blessed Lord comes forth, body, blood, soul, and divinity. See how the Mass is even encapsulated in that. It's really beautiful. And what about that line? They loved not their lives unto death. They loved not their lives unto death. In other words, those people, those who overcame, didn't love their own lives more than, uh, you know, they didn't value their own lives uh, uh, over giving witness to Christ. The two witnesses here, and later on we're going to see in chapter 13, verse 7, the saints give witness, and they, even with their very lives, they give up their lives in witness to our Almighty God. That's what we are called to do. 
We may not have a blood martyrdom, a red martyrdom, but we are called to give up our lives. We are called to live out a white martyrdom, uh, perhaps even a red martyrdom, we don't know. But uh, this is what we are called to do. So, this, uh, this whole uh, apocalypse then is, uh, is summarized beautifully um, in this event where Our Lady brings about the victory because Christ brings about the victory through Our Lady. But notice how he has the woman be such a key part of it. The dragon is cast underfoot harkens back all the way to the beginning. We see St. Michael there crushing the serpent. We see God the Father looking over it all. There's so many elements in this chapter which harken back to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we see this unnamed woman, Eve, who brought about the fall. She also encountered a serpent as he is described. He is described here as a serpent in chapter 12 verse 9 and so the same word is used in Genesis chapter 3 to describe the devil when he comes to approach Eve. We have Eve who is a virgin, we have Our Lady who is a virgin. Eve is simply referred to at that point as a woman and then Our Lady is referred to as a woman here in the Apocalypse and she's also referred to as a woman at the foot of the cross when our Lord says, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. By the way, and I'm going to do this one because this is a feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. What was the last request that Christ ever made before he died? What was the last command he gave before he died? You'll find it on the cross. You'll find it in John chapter 19 where he says, Behold your mother. The very last command our Lord Jesus gave before he died was, Behold your mother. Now, we put a lot of stock in people's dying requests, don't we? So I think we should put a lot of stock in that one for sure. But back to uh, the woman. So we see how the fall was brought about uh, by a virgin who was approached by a fallen angel, the serpent, the devil, who proposed something to her, and she, rather than trust to the agreement that she had with Almighty God, which was to not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, instead she took that fruit down from the tree, took it inside of herself by eating it, she gave it to the rest of humanity, which was Adam, and he ate it, and by eating that, death came into the world. Well, God, when he brings about the reversal, he sent another creature of an angelic nature. Not a fallen angel, as with Eve, but he sends the archangel Gabriel to a virgin, not Eve, but to the virgin Mary. Eve's name was Eva in Latin, and the archangel reverses that by saying Ave, Hail Mary. He proposes something to her, and she, rather than implicitly trust the word of the angel, especially if it was going to mean a violation of what she had already agreed to with our Lord, because what she had agreed to with our Lord was the vow she had taken at age three of perpetual virginity. And so she responds saying, how shall this be? For I know not man. And when the angel explains to her that it would not be by a violation of her vow that this would happen, she says, Very well, be it done unto me according to your word. I don't have to violate my vow, my agreement with God, unlike Eve who violated the agreement she had with God. If I don't have to violate that, then I accept it. And then what happened? She received what we call and what sacred scripture calls the fruit of her womb. Right? Luke chapter 1 verse 42, I believe it is. The fruit of her womb. St. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost, says to the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. This is where we get that line from the Hail Mary. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Curious expression, because our Lord Jesus is replacing and undoing the sin that was caused by that forbidden fruit, 
So our Lord Jesus, the fruit of the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary is placed back on the tree, this time the tree of the cross. The cross is like a tree because it's planted in the ground. It extends upward. It has branches. And there hangs on that tree the fruit of the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she gave that fruit of her womb back to the rest of humanity, to all of us. Now, no longer just Adam, but to all of us. And she gives us the fruit of her womb. And by eating of that fruit, we receive life unlike death. Now we have to receive Holy Communion in the state of grace. We cannot receive Holy Communion not in the state of grace. We have to be in the state of grace to receive. Otherwise, we will not have life given to us. And of course, that state of grace is restored by a sacramental confession to a priest. So Our Lady fulfills this in the uh, Book of the Apocalypse. Um, so we can see those elements. There's not I think you do understand some of those elements that are going on there. There's the, the dragon. He sweeps the, the, a third of the stars. We already saw how the stars symbolize the angels. Do you remember that? So he swept a third of the stars with his tail, showing how a third of the angels fell. He was cast down to the earth, he and his, his fallen angels. And so this is why they roam the earth. They're seeking whom they may devour. They tempt us uh, until they are relegated forever and eternally to hell. And then also uh, we see these, uh, the, these other elements where um, the, the woman was taken into the, into the desert, into the wilderness to be nourished. And she was there, uh, just like our, our, our Lady, uh, our Lord and St. Joseph were in the desert of Egypt uh, for a time uh, to be nourished and to be protected when the dragon wanted to eat her. Uh, notice that it says that the, that the dragon... Uh, was red. In verse 3 it says that the, dra the dragon was red. Um, uh, another word for uh, red is Edom. Now Herod was an Edomite. That's what Edom means is red. Herod was an Edomite and he was the one who tried to devour the child when he was born and so they had to flee into the desert for protection. But then what about in the future fulfillment, right? So remember how these elements have a fulfillment in the past but then they can point to something in the future? Well, the woman going into the desert in the wilderness that's fed for three and a half years, right? Well, this is pointing forward to the church being fed during the desert of the time of the Antichrist. When the Antichrist reigns, she is brought to the desert on the wings of the two eagles, right? So two wings of the great eagle were given to her, right? And this is chapter 12, verse 14. Uh, there was given to the woman two wings of a great eagle. Uh, the church fathers say that these, these two wings were Enoch and Elias, the two witnesses. That's what carried her and brought her uh, to that safe place where the dragon couldn't touch her, even though she was in the desert, as uh, she persevered as the church. And here this is a type of the church being uh, taken into the desert by the two witnesses, Enoch and Elias, and being nourished there, nourished with the manna in the desert, the Holy Eucharist, for the three and a half years during the reign of the Antichrist. And then we see a very curious thing in verse 15 where it says, the serpent cast out of his uh, mouth uh, as it were a river. Uh, let's, let's take a look at that image again and you can actually see that here depicted artistically. There's the water right here. See that water? So the water is coming out of the mouth of the serpent because the, the, this, this dragon let forth this water from its mouth to try and drown this, uh, this woman. Uh, well, it's a very curious image because we don't often see water connected with the dragon, right? We see water as a symbol of baptism. We see our Lord administering uh, the punishment of the flood through water, but we don't often see it connected with the dragon. So it's a very unique uh, image. But it's not so unique when we look back in the Old Testament and we see two instances where uh, this happens. So remember, at the, um, at the time of the Exodus, right after they crossed the Red Sea and they arrived safely at the other side in Exodus chapter 15, verse 12, it says that uh, the earth swallowed Pharaoh's army. The earth swallowed Pharaoh's army. So now here, Pharaoh's army is being uh, compared to, uh, to something that's being swallowed up by the earth. Well, this this flood, you might say flood of impurity or flood of iniquity that came, came out from the, 
the mouth of the dragon, was swallowed up by the earth also. We also see during the Exodus another image of the earth opening up, swallowing those that would uh, have attacked the good. And this is in the rebellion of Kor. Remember in Numbers chapter 16, Kor and his sons rebelled. They, this is a classic moment of you know, people rebelling against, uh, against the, the institutional authority that God set up in uh, Moses and Aaron. They rose up, they said, we, are we not all priests? All of the assembly are holy. Why do you raise yourself up above the people of God? Are not all the people holy? How many times we hear that today? When people want to usurp um, the uh, uh, authority of the priesthood, as it were. But we saw what happened. Kor and his sons rebelled. The earth opened up and swallowed them. And so now, in both of those cases, in Exodus chapter 15 and in Numbers chapter 16, uh, the, uh, the earth opening up and swallowing the people, is, it's, uh, the people who are rebelling is, or oppressing the Israelites, that's seen as an image of this flood and the earth swallowing up to take in uh, the flood so that it does not harm the people. Then finally, uh, let's conclude on the note with, uh, with regards to the dragon, how the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war on the rest of her seed. The rest of her seed. Now, who are the rest of her seed? It's not other physical children, no. The rest of her seed are those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I've had a number of conversations with folks where they object to our taking on of the Blessed Mother as our mother, calling to her as our mother, spiritual mother, and I just point out to them, well, look, do you have the testimony of Jesus Christ? Do you keep the commandments of God? And if they answer yes to that, then I'll tell them, well, and according to the Bible, you're one of the seed of this woman too. She's your mother if you bear testimony to Jesus Christ and keep the commandments. So uh, our blessed mother is indeed our mother. Thanks be to Almighty God. Uh, in his mercy for giving her to us. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see if we had any questions submitted on Facebook. Okay, so first question, uh, is there a reason why Enoch is chosen for the Gentiles and Elias for the Jews? Uh, so it's a good question. Now, uh, Enoch, as I alluded to, he was there, you might say, all the Gentiles are encompassed in Enoch. Enoch is a father of the Gentiles. Enoch was, you know, of the, the Gentile stock, as it were. I mean, because this is before the distinction comes in of Noah. This is even before Noah. So keep in mind, this is in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. That's before the, the, the flood of Noah. And it was after Noah. Remember the sons of Noah. That's where we have the three sons of Noah. Uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Those are the three sons of Noah. And it's from those three that we get the different peoples. Shem, written S-E-M in English. That's where we get the word Semite. Right? Semite as an anti-Semitic. Right? The children of Shem are the Semites. Right? But it includes a number of people. It includes not just the Hebrews, the sons of Heber. But it also includes, uh, you know, the Ishmaelites, the, you know, all the other, the, the Arabs and that sort of thing. They're, they're the, the, those are the Semites. And then there is Japheth. He is the father of the Gentiles. But they're all related and they had their father as Enoch. So Enoch has a more universal appeal in that, I don't say appeal, but he's more universal in that he is the father of all of them, right? He's the father of both Semites, the Gentiles, right? And the the, uh, the Philistines or the sons of Ham and you know Egypt and all those other uh, uh, children of uh, Ham. So uh, as I said, Enoch is the father of the Gentiles. Elias came from the Jewish stock. Elias had per the particular mission of trying to bring the kingdoms back together, because Elias preached during the time when the kingdoms were separated. Remember, there was a rebellion, and their two kingdoms split. Remember our Lord says the kingdom divided against itself cannot stand? That's what had happened to the nation of Israel. It had split to two kingdoms. Ten tribes in the north, 
This is the, the kingdom of Israel. And then two tribes in the south, uh, Judah and Benjamin in the south. And so those were the, that was the tribe of Judah, or the kingdom of Judah. Those ten tribes of Israel in the north got taken away. Uh, by the Assyrians, and they got dispersed. Remember, you've ever heard of the lost tribes of Israel? Those are the ten tribes that got dispersed, and we don't know where they went. Well, I mean, they continued on their traditions, and they ended up in Spain, and Italy, and Asia Minor. So the, those, those Jews kept on their traditions, so that when St. Paul came to preach in Spain, in Italy, in Asia Minor, they already had the backdrop, they already had the foundation. So although it was a horrible thing at the Babylonian captivity and at the dispersion of the uh, ten tribes in the north, it was a horrible thing for Israel, and yet it was a good thing because it enabled different parts of the world to receive the gospel because they already had the Old Testament. So Elias preached, Elijah preached during that time uh, of the split kingdoms. So he was specifically preaching to the Jews and to the Israelites, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. So that's what his mission was in the Old Testament, and that's what his mission will be in the New. Good question, though. Okay, will the signs be seen all around the world or just in Jerusalem? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, it would appear that it would be seen all around the world. Uh, we, we see that the, the bodies of the people lying in the streets of the great city in uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, would be seen by the nations. Um, in the time of the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, remember when our Lord, I believe it's in Matthew 24, where he's describing uh, how the temple would be destroyed, and he says, Then shall the sign of the Son of Man appear in the heavens. So, who's going to see that? Where is it going to be seen? Well, in the time of the destruction of the temple, this is exactly what happened. Josephus, he is a Jew. He is not a Christian. He has no, uh, no, no um, reason to advance the Christian cause. He says that there was a comet that hung over Jerusalem for the space of about a year. And he said the shape of this comet was in the, the shape of a sword. What does a sword look like? Right? He said it was like a sword hanging over Jerusalem for a whole year. And people were terrified at what this was. And this is the year prior to the destruction of the temple. And so they actually saw the sign of the Son of Man. Remember our Lord says, it, Then the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in the heavens. This comet, as Josephus describes it, Josephus, who was a Jew, describes this as a sword that hung over Jerusalem. So that one was seen in Jerusalem. It wasn't seen over the whole world. It's not clear as to if God will extend this sign to the whole world because it's meant for all of us now. We're all to be converted and we're not all in Jerusalem. Uh, or maybe it's something that will be visible in Jerusalem that we will be able to see perhaps by, by some media or whatnot. It's not clear uh, in my mind. Maybe someone else uh, has, a, has a better answer. But. Okay, good question. Next one. <laughs> Where is the Ark of the Covenant? Where's the Ark of the Covenant? So, the book of Maccabees tells us what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. And this is very interesting because uh, there was a movie that came out in the 80s, which I do not recommend. It's called The Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, they try and go out and seek this lost ark, Indiana Jones, and this big adventure, and, and they go looking for it in uh, Tanis or somewhere in Egypt or whatnot. And the reason why they're doing that, and they're searching for it in Egypt, because there's a reference to the ark being brought to battle the Egyptians. They try and bring the ark out to, to fight. Well, the makers of this movie were obviously not Catholic, because they didn't have seven books of the Old Testament, including the book of Maccabees. In the book of Maccabees, it describes what happened to the ark. Are you ready? It's going to be revealed if you've never heard this. But I don't exactly know where the ark is, so there's a spoiler. But however, uh, it's described in the book of Maccabees, so I wasn't expecting this question, so I'm not sure if I can find it quick enough. Um, so in the book of the Maccabees, uh, it's, the Maccabees described what happened to the ark. It was taken by Jeremiah 
um, trying to find the verse now, but uh, it was taken by Jeremiah for safekeeping when the Babylonian captivity took place. He took it and he hid it in Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is the mountain that overlooks the Holy Land just to the east. It's the mountain from which Moses saw the Holy Land, but he was not allowed to cross into the Holy Land. So Jeremiah uh, took that ark and hid it in Mount Nebo. And uh, he hid it there. Uh, however, uh, the problem was, it says, they went back to mark the spot, but they could not find it. Now, it's not clear, uh, it's not exactly clear uh, if it means they couldn't find the spot, or they went back and they couldn't find the ark. Like the ark was taken up. Uh, so, oh, there it is. Okay, so it's 2 Maccabees, chapter 2, verse 4 and following. It says, being warned by God, commanded that the tabernacle, tabernacle and the ark should accompany him, it's Jeremiah. Uh, he came forth to the mountain where Moses went up and saw the inheritance of God. It's Mount Nebo. And then in verse 5, when Jeremiah came thither, he found a hollow cave, and he carried in there the tabernacle and the ark, must have been a big cave, and the altar of incense, and he stopped up the door. Now here's the verse, verse 6. Then some of them that followed him came up to mark the place, but they could not find it. Couldn't find the place? It seems that that is the case, that they couldn't find the place. When Jeremiah perceived it, he blamed them, and he said, The place shall be unknown till God gather together the congregation of the people and receive them to mercy. Okay, so you have these uh, evangelicals who don't look in the book of, uh, and I'm not faulting them, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be pejorative here, but um, they don't know to look in the book of Maccabees, and they don't realize that it gives uh, an indication of uh, you know, what happened to the ark. So, last we know, it was somewhere in, Mount, in a cave in Mount Nebo. However, there is a Jewish tradition that the ark of the covenant was assumed into heaven. That's interesting, isn't it? Because we as Catholics understand from all those comparisons, there's church fathers who say that the Blessed Mother is the replacement for the Ark of the Covenant. She is the new Ark of the Covenant, the perfect Ark of the Covenant. Just like the Ark of the Covenant was fabricated of uh, acacia wood and covered with gold, so Our Lady was made of human flesh, but she was covered with grace. And so she became a fitting place to house the divinity to house our most blessed Lord. And so she also was assumed into heaven, right? So if you believe the Jewish tradition that the Ark of the Covenant was assumed into heaven, then you also can see how this was fulfilled and a type of Our Lady being assumed into heaven. So the bottom line is we don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is. I know there are some Coptics that claim that it's somewhere in Egypt, but they won't let anyone go in and see it. And who knows? Um, but the last we know from sacred scripture is that it was uh, uh, buried somewhere uh, on Mount Nebo in a place that was subsequently unable to be found. And that's, well, that's the next question. Where is Moses buried? He was buried on Mount Nebo. Uh, however, there is some interesting tradition that the Jews have, and you know, here we're stepping outside of sacred scripture, but uh, and. Just, you know, I'm not a Jew. <laughs> Some people think, wow, you're interested in the Old Testament so much. But look, I'm going to show you something. That is the Old Testament. That is the New. Can you see the difference? How much God puts in the Old Testament? Because that is revealing what's in the New. So we miss out. We miss out if we don't understand the Old Testament. I, we, there was someone who complained that we have the temple behind me. Why don't you have the, you know, the, you know, St. Peter's or something like that behind you? The point is, the temple's behind us. It's past. But that's the foreshadow of what is coming. So the, the, uh, the temple is fulfilled in the church. That's behind us. But it's, there's a lot we can learn about the temple. It was from the right side of the temple that, that Ezekiel first saw water flowing from the right side of the temple. Well, then we see that fulfilled with Christ when water, blood and water, flowed from the right side of his, the temple of his body when his heart was, was pierced. 
But anyway, so that's why I reference some of these Jewish things, not because I'm, I want you to be Jews or anything like that. It's because uh, there's a lot we can, we can learn. But with regards to where Moses uh, was buried, um, <clears throat> we have... We have this uh, reference. It's a really vague, obscure reference in uh, the Epistle of Jude, uh, chapter. Well, there's only one chapter, so sometimes you just you hear it, chapter one, verse nine, or sometimes you just hear verse nine because it's only one chapter to that epistle. Uh, it says, "When Michael the archangel, disputing with the devil, contended about the body of Moses, he did not bring against him the judgment of railing speech, but said, The Lord command you.'" So there, it seems there was some dispute over the body of Moses. The devil wanted to claim the body of Moses because he died outside of the promised land. Um, at that one moment, he disobeyed God in striking the rock instead of speaking to the rock to bring forth uh, the waters, which was supposed to be uh, a, a foreshadow of the Holy Mass. And that's why he did that. Do you know, um, maybe a little rabbit trail, but that's okay. Uh, I think we've got some time, and I think there's just a couple more questions. So uh, remember when Moses, the first time, he was told to strike the rock, and then the waters would come forth. And then the second time, God told Moses, speak to the rock, and the waters will come forth to feed the people, to give them drink in the desert. Moses, it seems, doubted the word of our Lord that just by speaking, he could bring the water forth because the first time he had to strike the rock. So the second time, Moses struck the rock twice. And God said, Moses, for that you will not enter into the promised land. Why such a harsh penalty, we might think? Actions have consequences, and God is trying to use each one of us to fulfill something of his glory that we are called to. And Moses was called at that moment to fulfill something of the passion, a foreshadow of the passion. Christ, who is the rock, was only to be struck once on Calvary, on the cross. And that brought forth the life-giving waters, the water that flowed from the side of Christ. He was only pierced once. Then God told Moses, when they were thirsty again later, speak to the rock and the waters will come forth. So Moses was just supposed to speak to the rock, not strike the rock again, because Christ was not struck more than once on the cross. I mean, obviously he was struck many times when he was crucified, but I'm saying he only died once. And Moses was only supposed to speak to the rock to bring forth the life-giving waters. Why was that an important analogy? What was God setting up? He was setting up a foreshadow of the Holy Mass. Strike the rock once. Our Lord has a bloody crucifixion once. Subsequent to that, to bring the life-giving waters, the blood and water which flowed from the side of Christ, all that a priest need do is speak to the rock. Speak the words of consecration, and Christ comes forth. How do we know this is the case and not just some you know, Catholic projection onto it? Because of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 1 through 10. And there he describes how they all drank of the same spiritual rock which followed them in the desert. And St. Paul says, and the rock was Christ. So Moses, for that reason, was excluded from the promised land. He died outside of it. That's because there was also supposed to be a new Moses. Christ Jesus is the new Moses who brings us on the real exodus, the exodus out of slavery of sin to the promised land of heaven. So he was not to lead them into the promised land. Moses was not. Christ was. So that's uh, why God allowed that, that mistake of Moses to happen and wh how he fulfilled it uh, and made it actually an even deeper type um, than originally could have been the case. So, okay. Question. Can you talk more about the atmospheric heaven where Enoch and Elias are? Hmm. Do the Father say where that is, a physical place on our universe, what's their state of existence, what the experience of God and of life? Okay, so the understanding is uh, there's different ideas, and there's just many ideas out there, right? St. Paul talks about the seventh heaven. He was taken up to the seventh heaven. Uh, the Fathers say that the heavens that we see, and that includes all the whole 
you know, imperial heavens, empirical heavens, right? The, all the stars and everything. He goes, that's the first heaven. But then there's six more beyond that. And St. Paul was taken up to the seventh heaven. Now, where are Enoch and Elias? Are they taken up into one of those? It's, it's not clear. It's not clear to my mind, at least. Um, this isn't something I've done in particular research on, so uh, there may be answers out there that are uh, pretty obvious that I just don't know. But I do know the fathers say that uh, when it says they were taken up to paradise, they say that they were taken to a place on earth that was hidden to the eyes of men. Uh, St. Robert Bellarmine espouses this idea, and so that's what's generally understood, is that they, were, they are someplace, they're either someplace on this earth that is hidden to the eyes of men, perhaps in a state that we can't see even, so that may be the hidden from the eyes of men, in other words, not like they're necessarily visible, maybe they were assumed into some different... I don't mean like another dimension or, you know, I don't want to get into that kind of new age nonsense, but, you know, uh, taken up from the eyes of men so that we can't see them, perhaps some, somewhere on this earth, that's what the church fathers believe. And uh, they're, it's, the understanding is they do not see the beatific vision right now. Like Adam and Eve did not see the beatific vision, right? But they can still have commune with God, just like Adam and Eve had conversation with God. God walked with them in the afternoon Error that says in uh, Genesis chapter 3. So uh, Enoch and Elias can have this perhaps interaction with God. So it's just not so clear to me. I haven't done particular research uh, on this. So I apologize if that's a bit of an inc incomplete answer. Another question, uh, why does St. John call Jesus the Word in his gospel? That's a really good question. We use that a lot. We talk about the Word and the Word made flesh. That is, that is a very, very good question. And there's a good answer. Uh, I hope I can arc articulate it correctly, but uh, the answer is this. It has to do with the life of the Trinity. This is beautiful. It's, it's really neat to, to see how this works out. First, we start with the Father. And, this, and it has to do with the life of the Trinity and the procession of the other two persons from the Trinity. So we start with the Father. You might say we start with the idea of God who is real, it's the, it's the most real idea there is, the idea of God, God the Father. That's what we start with, the reality. Now, you can have a reality and then you want to express the reality, you want to convey the reality. You have something then that you ascribe to that would encapsulate that reality, like a name, right? So you might think of someone, you may have someone in mind, and then you say the name. And that name represents the person. So as soon as you say the name of someone, you know who you're talking about, and you say, okay, that's the person who we have. So we have the reality, the person, but then you have the name, a word, which represents that whole person, and you have the word. So Christ, Jesus, or we could say God the Son, right? So before he even took on that human flesh and was known as Jesus in the flesh, but the, God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, is the Word that perfectly reflects the Father. He is the Word, the image. So a, a, a Word is, is, a, uh, is, a, is like an image. Or it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's like a word picture. It's, it's a verbal picture of something. So Christ Jesus being the Word, or I should say God the Son being the Word, this is before He entered into time. So we're still talking about before time. The word perfectly reflects the idea of the Father. If it's a good word, if it's an accurate word, if it's a complete word, it would perfectly reflect the reality it represents. So the reality is God the Father. The perfect image of that reality is the word that perfectly reflects that. That's the Son. That's why we call him the word, because he perfectly reflects the Father. That's why he says, he who sees me sees the Father. So when we see Christ, we see the Father because He perfectly reflects. He is equal to the Father. All that the Father has, the Son has in like manner. All that the Father does, the Son does in like manner. Then, if you want to express that word, here's where we get to the third person. If you want to express that word, what do you need? A voice. It's so interesting to search through sacred scripture and see how many times the Holy Ghost is referred to in some way as the voice which carries the word and therefore the idea, the reality of the Father. 
That's what the Holy Ghost is. He is the voice that expresses or brings to us the word. Search the scriptures and you'll see. Search for voice and see how that's related to the Lord, to God, and you'll see how many times it is connected with the Father. Uh, it's interesting in the Old Testament when the Holy Ghost is spoken of, uh, there is, uh, there there's always seems to be a reference of, there's not a lot of words spoken. Because at that point, the word had not been expressed. So we don't see words necessarily coming from the Holy Ghost. In fact, our Lord even says before, while he's walking on this earth, before he died, he, spe- he says, uh, he talks about, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, Holy, the, the movement of the Holy Ghost. There's motion, there's action. But then, once we get to the Acts of the Apostles, once the Holy Ghost descends upon the Apostles, then we see the Holy Ghost speaking, speaking whole sentences, whole paragraphs, and now it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot behind that voice uh, that's, that's uh, being expressed in the Acts of the Apostles and onward. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the idea. Um, so uh, another, another question uh, just came in. Um, so if Enoch and Elias uh, do not have the beatific vision, does that mean that they could sin? Uh, it is theoretically possible that they could. Although St. John of the Cross says that for those that are in the unitive way, they have arrived at a spot that they can't sin, because they're in the unitive way. In the three ages of the interior life, uh, there's the purgative way, the, the uh, illuminative way, and then the unitive way. There, there's a certain stage where St. John of the Cross says it's, the person's not going to sin, the person can't sin. Not that it's, it, it's you know, metaphysically impossible for them to sin, but that they just won't sin. They've arrived at that union. But... Theoretically, they, they could, I suppose, because uh, it's when you see some other good, and this is what they're not going to see, though. They're not going to see some other good as greater than God. It's when we see falsely some good is greater than the state of grace, which is just an, an error uh, that we sin. The only way someone could, uh, could make that mistake is if they don't see who God really is. If you see what goodness itself is, if you see who God is, you cannot sin. So, okay, good questions, good chapters in this uh, study. Uh, We'll pick up again in a couple of weeks. So we do this on the first and the third Wednesdays of the month. And so we'll pick up again on the third Wednesday of this month uh, with uh, chapter 13 and 14. So let's close with a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. And I'll give you all a blessing. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos et maniat semper. Amen. God bless.